Welcome to Literary Libations with Librarians. And this week we are going to be sharing books that we're thankful exist because it is Thanksgiving week. And so we want to get all of that gratitude out there. As we're talking, if you hear any titles that you are interested in getting your hands on, there are several ways to go about doing that. The first and maybe the most direct way would be to contact your local branch of the Monroe County Library System and speak to them about requesting the item and what formats are available. Any of our staff would be more than happy to help you do that. You can also, if you'd prefer to do it yourself, request through our online catalog that will get you to physical versions, hardcovers, paperbacks, um, audiobooks on CD, large print, and the web address for our catalog is on your screen now. Some of the items that you hear us talk about are also going to be available in digital formats, and we have two platforms that will allow you to do that. If you see it referred to as OverDrive, you can use the OverDrive um, platform, and the app for OverDrive is referred to as Libby. So if you are in your app store, you can type in Libby and it will come up. And OverDrive provides downloadable ebooks and downloadable audiobooks. We also offer Hoopla, and Hoopla offers downloadable ebooks, audiobooks, and also movies, music, and graphic novels. And the great thing about Hoopla is that there is never a wait for any of the items that you see on there. You can download them immediately and get started. And with us this week, um, you have me as usual. My name is Jennifer Grineski. And, our, and I am the community librarian at the Dundee Branch Library. And our introductory question this week is, in this wild and crazy year of 2020 that has been unprecedented, I think, what are you thankful for in addition to your family? And so I thought about that, and I think what I'm most thankful for are those unique moments that I got to spend with my son, which I know is still sort of family oriented, but it's the weird things that came out of that quarantine back in March and April, because Tony and I were both home. We were trying to come up with things to do together because I didn't want to just watch TV all day. So we ended up going for a lot of walks. We did photo scavenger hunts on our walks. We did one where we looked for the different colors of the rainbow and had to take a picture of it. Um, we went and did the art walk in Tecumseh, um, printed off at home all the different pieces of art that they have there in Tecumseh, and we went and looked at all of them and got pictures with some of them. Um, and then just walking down our little rural highway, um, there's almost never any cars, and just walking and talking with each other about whatever my then sixth grader wanted to talk about back in the spring. Um, and those are things that wouldn't have happened without that shutdown. Um, so I'm thankful for those unique moments that wouldn't have happened any other way. So that's mine. And also with us this week, we have Jody Russ, who is the community librarian at the Bedford Branch Library. And what are you thankful for this year, Jody? Um, well, the first thing I would say is gardening has probably been a very good mental relaxation for me. So I have all kinds of different projects that I started at home um, for gardening and I just love ha my, ha there's something, you know, very um, relaxing about having my hands in the soil, I guess, and seeing things come from that. I just planted 200 bulbs in my new garden bed in my front yard. Whoever wants to plant 200 bulbs is insane, I just have to say, because um, my hands were killing me from that. But in the spring, it's going to be glorious, right? But I also want to say I'm very thankful for the job that I have and the people that I work with. Um, the library system is a fantastic place to work, and I'm just happy to be here and to be spending my career at Monroe County um, and with all the lovely people that I work with. Uh, thank you, Jody. <laughs> and because you know, I know that was directed <laughs> for me, of course. <laughs> also with us this week, we have Stephanie Winterstein, who is the Youth Services Librarian at the Ida and Summerfield Petersburg branches. And what are you thankful for this year, Stephanie? 
Um, well, you know, of course my family, but part of it would be time. Um, before all this started, um, our schedules were crazy busy. Um, you know, sometimes it would be like, okay, four places after work and we wouldn't get home until super late and trying to be in two or three places at one time. And I told myself, I said, when the, well, all this is over and we can get back to things, I said, I will never, uh, you know, take that for granted again that we have this time and I will never complain um, again. And so uh, I'm trying to remember that as things were kind of getting busy again, um, but it's it's been a good thing. Um, <clears throat> you know, in the beginning, we would you know do things that we wouldn't always do like we would the kids would make dinner for us and they would each take a night making dinner which was something different that never happened and they enjoyed that uh, we would do different games that you know i have three teenagers they don't want to hang out with us um, so the <laughs> fact that you know they did that and that they enjoyed it we all got to enjoy it together was real was really nice so um yeah i just think time and Time with the family, even though it wasn't <laughs> not family, but you know, by default, that's who we were with. And yeah. it's been a really good thing, especially having one who's a senior and will be gone next year. It made us appreciate all that a little more. So, yeah. That's Thanks, me. Stephanie. Also with us this week, we have Jen McCarty, who is the reference librarian at the Ellis Library. And what are you thankful for this year, Jen? Um, I was going to say, technology it's kind of a it's a it's a love hate thankful thing <laughs> um, <laughs> it's made so many things possible that wouldn't be um you know working throughout the pandemic like when the library was shut down a lot of us were still able to kind of do some stuff start looking towards the future because we have computers and we can talk to each other um even now you know a little more flexibility because i can do some stuff from home and that's okay schooling as much as i hate virtual schooling and remote schooling and i it's awful but <laughs> if if we didn't have that option i don't know what we'd be doing so mm -hmm. at least that we have that you know it's it's a fallback and it's you know maybe it's not always the easiest but it's there and it's i am grateful for because the kids are still learning they're still connecting in some way to their peers and their teachers um and that is another thing that I have a lot of family that has moved away. So back to family, we can't get away from it. But I have family in Maine and I have family in um, South Carolina and my aunt, who's pretty much like my parents, moved in January. And then, you know, not only could we, you know, not just see them like we did all the time anyway, but now like my uncle was supposed to come home and, you know, in March for a little bit and couldn't. Um, they were supposed to be coming back this summer and couldn't. So technology has allowed us to see them and talk to them. And, you know, like Halloween, my, you know, we, we Skyped my aunt in Maine and she showed us all of their decorations and, you know, we got to talk with that. And those are things that even 10 years ago, we probably wouldn't have had as easily. So technology, uh, it's made as isolating as like, especially during the shutdown, as isolating as it could have been we still had that opportunity to talk to people and physically see people, Zoom. Um, it's it's good and bad, but it is something that I am grateful that we do have in this time because it, I think it helps us at the very least remember that we're all in this together. Yes, absolutely. I've been super thankful for technology, the ability to work remotely to see some family that I wouldn't be able to see otherwise. Thank you, John. And also with us this week, we have Ashley Lyford, who is the community librarian at the Summerfield Petersburg branch. And what are you thankful for this year, Ashley? Well, so I know puppies are um, part of my family, <laughs> but like, as you can see, these little guys all the time. Um, can't even sit in a chair without them both needing to be on my lap. Um, so I'm thankful for them and um, probably like most of you said, just the time while we were off. Um, I've never had time like that. Like I, since I could work, I've always worked. Um, so it was kind of like a summer vacation back in like elementary school, you know? And um, not only did I get to spend time with my niece and my husband playing games and stuff, but I got to spend a lot of time on my own too. I started walking five miles a day and 
um, just, you know, time outside. I can't, now I can't live without it, it seems, which is tricky since it's dark outside at like <laughs> 2 p.m. Um, but probably, probably just the extra time we had. Um, I will toss into that um, my husband is home. I can't imagine having done lockdown with my husband still traveling. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Ashley. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to move on to those books that we are thankful exist for whatever reason that might be. And we have a <laughs> wide variety of choices this week. And I am going to let, I think I'll let Stephanie kick us off. If you want to start sharing your books that you're thankful oh. exist. I always get to go first. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, you're right there on my screen. You're oh, the one I see. I see myself down in the little corner. So, all right. <laughs> um, I, the first, um, this first one was really easy. Um, it was the Little House on the Prairie series. Um, and I know that kind of sounds like cliche, but back when I was little, I had the whole series and they were all yellow. They're not as colorful as they are these days, but they were all yellow covers with very like watercolory pictures. Um, and I read them all. I read them all multiple times. Um, I was gonna keep them for my kids and I did keep them for my kids, but now the pages are like so nasty and yellow um, and they wouldn't wanna read them, but they have read their own and they both have their own sets of the same books and they've read them all. Um, they wanna keep them for their kids. Those are like the ones that, you know, I believe one of them got damaged at one point um, and she was very upset at her sister because her sister was the one who ruined it. And so she had to buy her, her a new copy of that same title, but it didn't look the same. It was like a whole thing. Um, but I think the reason I'm thankful for those are, it was because uh, it was, a, it was a, a series that we could enjoy together um, at the same point in our lives, but that it's special to us. So I don't know. I just kind of, one well, just kind of close to my heart. <laughs> I think I still have the yellow cover versions as well. I don't think I have them at my house. I think my dad still has those. Yeah. I have a lot of things that need to leave my parents' house still, which I you actually, would think. <laughs> I think. Those are actually my parents' basement as well. Um, but they're I've seen them and they're, like I said, not in great shape, but they're not going anywhere. Those are the ones that they're yeah. not allowed to get rid of. Um, and my girls too, my, my oldest daughter, her bookshelf is color coordinated. Um, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was like a whole thing because it was like, what, where do I put these? Because every they got they different spot. Color, <laughs> they needed to stay together. So they have their own spot at the bottom of the bookshelf. So. Decisions. Yes. But it's nice. It's just a very special series to all of us. So I'm thankful for that. Um, the other one is going to sound a little corny, but <laughs> um, it's The Five Love, Love Languages by Gary Chapman. Um, and this, I'm feeling my husband's in the other room listening to this, so he's probably going to laugh at me later, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I'm a very sappy person. I'm a very romantic person and he is not, he's the <laughs> polar opposite <laughs> of romance and he'll be the first person to tell you this. Um, and so when I read this book and I did the little, there's a little quiz in it, um, that tells you what your love languages are. And mine was, I think, words of affirmation. So I need to hear like all kinds of good things all the time. <laughs> um, and I think it was quality time. Uh, I'm not sure on the second one, but I know the first one was words of affirmation because this was a whole thing. And I was like, why don't you know, you don't like say all these nice things. And he's like, that's not me. That's not who I am. And and he's like, but he's like, I, I just show you I love you. So I had him take the quiz and he was um, acts of service. So he shows all of us his love by doing things for us. Um, so after reading this book and, uh, you know, understanding it a little more, um, it definitely changed my perspective on things um, and the kids, you know, kind of like have feelings about them now too. So like, it's just kind of funny because I, I can look at things differently now. Like it's not just one thing, it's many things um, and everyone has a different way of approaching it. So 
I don't know. I'm just thankful for that. I, I never really looked at it other than like how I am. I'm like, well, this is, this is how I am. This is how everyone should be. <laughs> Why don't you say it? <laughs> you yeah. know? So it, like I said, it's kind of corny. I do hear his voice in there. So I know he's listening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, we've had these discussions too, because I also happen to be a words of affirmation person. I like to hear nice things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what it is. Like you can tell me my shoes look nice. You can tell me, you know, like, hey, thanks for, you know, making dinner. It doesn't matter what it is. I just like to hear it. And my husband is not as verbal as (laughs) I am, (laughs) as you know, if there's anything to talk about, I can talk about it for, you know, Right. three hours. Um, I, I, I don't want to do it in a big group of people. Give me like one on one, but then I can talk about it forever. Right. Um, so, yeah, it was helpful to understand that and be aware that he's not not saying that I'm pretty every day because he's not thinking it. Right. He's yeah. just expressing it differently. Right. Well, that's so. like my favorite thing is I'll be like, does this look like, do I look OK? Do I look pretty? You look fine. <laughs> What? <laughs> Fine. This is your opportunity. Here, right. here's a list of nice things you can tell me at any time. <laughs> you know, we're working on some of those things, but you know, we've had many, many discussions beyond that now, and we understand each other a whole lot more. But it, it was just, it was very eye-opening when yes. I read this book, and it, it helps now. It's, it's kind of like a running joke, you know, yeah. like. Well, you know, I'm an access service person and you are definitely not. <laughs> so, so yes, I'm thankful for that because it's, it's helped open my eyes to seeing things a little differently. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. And just out of curiosity, has anybody else read the book? Yes. I've not read the whole thing. I've read like parts of it and I think I need to because I, I definitely, I, I think, I think most of us could benefit, not just in a like, intimate relationships but just right. in general you know yeah. like oh this is how this person gives feedback or whatever right you know? like even even like in work like no you're you know, exactly. why, why isn't my boss constantly telling me i'm doing a good job i'm doing a good job <laughs> <laughs> no you're exactly right it's like a personality trait yeah um, it, it it definitely is so i totally agree with that <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not physical touch at work. Yeah. Yeah, no. You know. That could be a little weird, but. <laughs> there's, there's words of affirmation, physical touch, receiving gifts, acts of service, and quality time. So maybe all of those don't apply, but, you know. But just kind of just the general idea that, yeah. you know, we all approach things differently, differently. and it's okay. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Thank you, Stephanie. And let's have Jody share her books that she's thankful for. Okay, I have three books that I'm going to, well, three things that I'm going to talk about. So the first book that I'm going to pick to talk about is called Peter and the Starcatchers by Dave Barry and Ridley Pearson. Um, It's a juvenile fiction book. Um, Dave Barry is an adult satire writer and Ridley Pearson is well known for his suspense thriller kind of books. Um, And they said they're friends and they said that they got together and wrote this story because their children had they had read the stories of Peter Pan with their children and their children asked them how Peter Pan became Peter Pan. And so the two of them got together and wrote this and um, um, it's it's a riveting adventure. I'm going to read a little bit from the blurb of the book. It's a riveting adventure that takes you on a journey from a harsh, harsh orphanage in old England to a treacherous sea in a decrepit old tub. Aboard the Neverland is a trunk that holds a magical substance with the power to change the fate of the world. Just a sprinkle and wounds heal, just a dusting and people can fly. Towering seas and a violent storm are the backdrop for battles at sea. Bone crushing waves eventually land our characters on Mollusk Island where the action really heats up. And so, I really loved this story when I first read it. I'll be honest with you, I listened to it. I highly recommend the audio version um, because Jim Dale reads it, which is the guy who reads all the Harry Potter books. Uh, Unfortunately, MCLS doesn't have the audio version anymore, but you can get it via Melcat on either playaway format or audio CD. Excuse me a second. 
because I mean Jim Dale to listen to is just fantastic and that's really how I came across this book. I searched for other things that he read and um, that's what led me to this. But there's a whole bunch of books in the series now of Peter and the Star Catchers. Some of them really lengthy novels, other ones of them more kind of a there's it's still a chapter book, but it's a fairly short version. Um, but it, it really tells you the story of how Peter Pan became Peter Pan and where all of those um, fantastical adventures began and it's really pretty cool. Um, the second thing I chose was any compilation of Sherlock Holmes books. I absolutely, first of all, I love watching Sherlock Holmes movies and shows and series and all of those things too, but I feel like this, um, Arthur Conan Doyle really, you know, really made the mystery novel what it is and you can pick up you know, so many different authors are just, they've created what they have because of his influence. Um, and I can't really get enough of that. I feel like they're the kind of stories that if you read them over again, especially if it's been a while, you're always going to take something different away from them um, and, and hear more about one thing than you may have the last time you read it. Uh, I also love listening to them because they always have a wonderful English accented author or reader, which is um, always a good thing in my opinion. Simon Preble being one of my favorites. Um, so it, anyway, I think um, anything Sherlock Holmes related is always interesting and can take your mind away from, you know, that's kind of what I was looking for in books that I'm thankful for is things that can really take me away to somewhere else and make me think about something else and keep my mind engaged. And then the third thing I want to talk about is Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. And I have a I have a brief little show and tell here. Is this going to show up with my little background or not? Um, here, let me take my background off for a minute because I don't really need that on anyway, right? Um, Oh, that's not going to work. Sorry. OK, anyway, I have where the sidewalk ends here. I wanted you guys to see this because this is the original 1974 copy that I got when I was in second grade. It's actually signed on the inside with my name and the teacher that I had in second grade. Aww. We would definitely weed it's not in any condition to exist in there <laughs> anymore, but I keep this book anyway. Shel Silverstein's masterful. Um, it, you know, if you're not familiar with him, first of all, you should be. I think most people know about The Giving Tree, Where the Sidewalk Ends, and several of, of his other books are compilations of poetry. Um, but he's the guy who wrote Boa Constrictor. You know, you guys have sung I'm Being Eaten by a Boa Constrictor, right? And so that's Shel Silverstein. And so many other things like the unicorn, um, you know, a long time ago when the earth was green. Peter, Paul and Mary didn't write that, Shel Silverstein did. So, um, but one of my favorites, and I'm just going to give you a little, I'm not going to read it from the book. I'm going to, because I remember this from second grade. I'm very old, you guys. 1974 <laughs> was second grade for me, right? <clears throat> Sarah Cynthia Sylvia Stout. I'm going to put the book over here so you guys know. Sarah Cynthia Sylvia Stout would not take the garbage out. She'd scour the pots and scrape the pans, candy the yams and spice the hams. And though her daddy would scream and shout, she simply would not take the garbage out. And so it piled up to the ceiling, coffee grounds, potato peelings, brown bananas, rotten peas, chunks of moldy cottage cheese. That's about as far as I can go, but like <laughs> never going to leave my head, Sarah Cynthia Sylvia Stout. Um, <laughs> It, it goes for two pages of all the garbage that piles up and finally she shouts, OK, I'll take the garbage out. But of course, by then it was too late. The garbage had reached across the state from New York to the Golden Gate and there in the garbage that she did hate, poor Sarah met an awful fate that I cannot right now relate because the hour is much too late. But children remember Sarah Stout and always take the garbage out. <laughs> Those are my books. <laughs> oh, I love Shel Silverstein. The only thing I remember, though, I don't remember which book it is, but man, did he have the creepiest author picture oh, ever. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, clearly, like, as a kid, like, you turn it over and, like, I don't know, you're reading all these fun poetry. And occasionally, you know, like, poor Sylvia Stout, things don't turn out well for the children in them. <laughs> but, you know, so be it. But then you see Shel Silverstein's picture and they don't pick 
pictures back then apparently like they do now because he does not look like a man that you're going to be like, hey, come sign like, my book. Oh, thank you. Nice. Don't let your small children see exactly. the back cover of the book when you're reading the story. Where I'm like, oh! But he's, he's got such fabulous poetry, and his books are so fun mm -hmm. to read. And I am amazed that you still remember <laughs> memorizing that from Amazing. second grade. <laughs> it's just stuck in there. Things from last week? Maybe not so much. Not so much, no. But you need me to talk to you about Sylvia Stout? Jody's got, got that. <laughs> Thank you, Jody. Sure, thanks. Uh, let's have Jen share her books that she's thankful exists. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to, both of mine are real nerdy. So I think I'll start with the nerdiest of my picks. Um, <laughs> the first book is The Elements of Style by William Strunk and E.B. White. Um, I had to read this in Advanced Composition, which is the class for writing fellows at Monroe County Community College. Shout out to Tim Dillon. He was my teacher. One of the hardest teachers I've ever had. And I can honestly say one of the teachers that taught me the most. So, Mr. Dillon, if you happen to be re watching this, which I'm sure you probably aren't, thank you for being really, really hard, but really impactful. And this is still my copy from those days. And I will not get rid of it because I'm a dork and a nerd and I love it. Um, and why I'm thankful for this book is Writing is something that I've always enjoyed. There was a time when I thought I'd be a writer. I'm not disciplined enough for that, so I won't. Um, but it's still something I enjoy. And I think most of us, especially people who like in the library world, obviously we kind of like words. So I think most of us take kind of writing for granted and we do it so we do a lot of it. Um, but even, you know, emails there's still stylistic choices. There's still things that you should be doing. And I think this is so impactful because it's rules. It's just rules for writing and it's it's easy to understand. It's not a complicated writing manual. It's I mean, like the it starts off with rules of usage. It's just really general stuff where to put your commas. Um, do not break a sentence in two and he gives like really practical things, but my favorite stuff are the really stylistic things. And I feel like this goes so well for academic writing, which obviously is where this started for me, but also creative writing. And this is one of my very favorites. So I'm going to give you a dramatic reading from Evie, from, you know, Strunk and White, I'm Element Strunk Style. Avoid fancy words. Avoid the elaborate, the pretentious, the coy, and the cute. Do not be tempted by a $20 word when there is a 10 center handy, ready, and able. Anglo-Saxon is a livelier tongue than Latin, so use Anglo-Saxon words. In this, as in so many matters pertaining to style, one's ear must be one's guide. Gut is a lustier noun than intestine, but the two words are not interchangeable because gut is often inappropriate, being too coarse for the context. Never call a stomach a tummy without a good reason. <laughs> And it goes on, like, if you love the word discombobulate, you're not going to like this guide. Um, <laughs> but I think that's so accurate. I think especially especially when you're like in high school and college and you're trying to fill out, I've got to write 12 pages. Let me find the longest word possible. OK, cool. It doesn't make you sound smart. It makes you makes you sound like you're trying to find the longest word possible. Um, so I just I just love the practical information here and I find myself referring to it still. Um, I just think it's actually a truly, truly helpful writing guide that's not pretentious. It's not overly complicated um, and like things like that. You know, it's it's not it's telling you to to be concise, to be to be clear, to be, you know, don't use fancy words when you don't have to. So I just love that. I love this book. I will never get rid of it. It makes me very, very happy. Um, and my second choice that I am thankful for are the complete works of William Shakespeare. <laughs> and I chose this for a couple of reasons. Number one, I genuinely like Shakespeare. Oh, yay. And Jennifer used my my preferred. It's not a small book. <laughs> it's thick. This is also the book that I've had since college. Um, another shout out, Dr. McCluskey. I had some, you know what? Honestly, I've been to several universities and schools and whatnot. The best teachers I ever had were at Monroe County Community College. So, way to go, Monroe County Community College. Sadly, <laughs> both of those people have retired. 
but they're fabulous people. Um, I genuinely love Shakespeare, but the, the bigger reason that I wanted to choose this is something that I'm thankful for is because Shakespeare is kind of the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> there are so, like Sherlock Holmes, you know, that like started something. Um, how many things that we love, like I, I'm, I'm a movie person, I'm a TV person. There are so many movies that are total ripoffs of Shakespeare. <laughs> the Lion King, Hamlet, um, cheesy teen movies. There's like 37 versions of Romeo and Juliet, some of which you don't know. West Side Story, I'm a musical theater person. That's basically Romeo and Juliet with a slightlier happier ending because they don't all die. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 10 Things I Hate About You is basically the taming of the shrew. It's one of my favorite teen movies. Um, there are so many versions of popular fiction that you might not even realize are basically, you know, ripoffs of of Shakespeare. So I'm thankful that Shakespeare, the complete works of Shakespeare exist, not just for Shakespeare itself, which I do love, but also because it's kind of the gift that keeps on giving. Because there's so many other things in popular culture that that oh, you know, pay homage to Shakespeare or take the basic ideas from those stories and they make them, you know, fun for the modern age. So I am very, very thankful for Mr. William Shakespeare. Yay, Shakespeare. I love Shakespeare, too. I do have a question, though. The E.B. White that wrote Strunk and White, is it the same E.B. White that wrote, isn't it E.B. White that wrote Charlotte's Web? It is. I, I, is it I the don't same know. person? I'm guessing And I never made is. this connection before? Um, hmm. I was trying to see if there's anything about the author. Reference and it doesn't question like there is. later. <laughs> That's a reference. Yeah, I, I will find out. I'm, I'm guessing. Librarian reference is. question. How many E.B. Um, Whites can there be that are writers? Oh, and, and it seems very specific to use those. But because I, in my writing class in college, we use Shrunk and White as well. But apparently, I I don't know. I was looking at this going. It is. E.B. White? White's is, prose is celebrated for its ease and clarity. Just think of Charlotte's Web. Yeah. Ah, well, nice to know. E.B. White can make me cry. Can't help <laughs> me write better. <laughs> make you cry uh, while you write better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably happened in my lifetime. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jen. And let's have Ashley share her books that she is thankful for. Okay. So first, um, Jody, I just have to say, like, they got a push. Well, um, Shel Silverstein pretty hard in second grade because <laughs> this is also my copy and I can recite, um, you know, the boa constrictor one. Uh, like my teacher brought me this book when I was sick at home, like I just kept it forever. Second grade, apparently that's when they really pushed Shel Silverstein. <laughs> um, so my books, um, I will start with this one. This is called I Am Enough by Grace Byers. Um, they actually, two of my books actually have a theme, I'm Enough. Um, this came out actually just two years ago, so it's not like I read it when I was a kid or anything, but um, just, you know, the point behind it thing, like, I have a voice, whether I can sing well or not sing, I am trying as hard as I can to be everything I can, um, and it goes through a whole series of things, um, but at the end, you know, it's, she just says, I am enough. Um, I think this is a really great book for kids to start with, um, as that is an issue I feel like a lot of adults still have. Uh, so I really like that it's being addressed in an easy child's book and hopefully, you know, inspiring them from a young age to have confidence and um, feel like they're enough. Uh, I don't actually have the copy of the next book I want to talk about. Um, Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. Sorry, I live right by a railroad track. <laughs> Um, but I do have three of her other books because I love her. Um, so Daring Greatly is one of her books that discusses vulnerability. Actually, a lot of her books discuss vulnerability. Um, but basically, it's the thought that, uh, you know, vulnerability is hard. Being real is hard. Letting people see the real you is hard. Not protecting yourself, you know. Um, but that's when the greatest moments of life happen. Like when you allow yourself to be vulnerable and have people get close to you or experience hard things, that's when we learn and when we grow. Um, really, anything by her is amazing. She's got a podcast now, and I see her in person one year. 
That was amazing. I love Brene Brown. If you don't know her, you should you should look her up because she's she amazing. has an amazing TED talk. She that's yes, been she watched does. like a bajillion times. That's yep. where I know her from because I've seen that. Unfortunately, I've not yet read any of her books, but her TED talk was incredible. Yeah, yeah. she actually during the pandemic, um, she is a she is strong in her faith, um, and you know people couldn't go to churches. Um, so she did this Instagram live thing every Sunday. I'm not a super faithful person, but it was more just like hope and um, encouragement. So like every Sunday you could log on, she'd do this Instagram live, give a nice, wonderful talk. Um, and I would, it would just leave me feeling better. Um, so she, I mean, she's just amazing in all aspects. Check her out. Um, the last also thing. Her. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say her. If you listen to her books on audio, oh, like I'll be driving down my car, like in my car listening, and then she'll say something and it'll like, I'll get chills because I'll be like, that applies yeah. or like, oh my goodness. It, it was one of the books I was going to use too. So I totally agree that I'm thankful for it as well. But it's, it's, you definitely makes you think and, you know, like I said, touches you in different ways. But listening to her voice is also very soothing. Yeah, she's got a little bit of an accent, and I love mm -hmm. it. Um, really, I just clearly love everything about her. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you liked it too, Steph. Sorry, I, I stole your title. <laughs> Fine, um, you did it. <laughs> the other series I want to talk about is kind of odd, something to be thankful for. But I'm gonna, um, you know, be a little sappy here for a moment. Uh, what like? I don't know, in 2008, we started a book club at Dorsch, which we've actually talked about this book club before, uh, Books with Bikes, and Jen still runs it to this day. It's just got a different name. Uh, one of the books that we read um, early on was Moon Called by Patricia Briggs. Um, it's a whole series. There's tons of them. Uh, the main character is named Mercedes Thompson, and she's actually a shapeshifter. She can shift, she can shift into a werewolf. Her mother didn't know like how to deal with that uh, when she went and coyote saw a oh coyote when she went and saw a coyote in her in the baby crib um but she uh had like an uncle who was a uh shapeshifter into a werewolf and um so mercedes was raised by them she was raised as part of their um like grouping and uh it's it's about her and you know there's vampires and all sorts of fantasy stuff um, but the real reason that I like this book and a few others very much like mm -hmm. this, that I'm thankful for it, is because these books really gave me a friend group. Um, Jen, like, that, these books are how we bonded and we became friends. Now we've been friends for, you know, like 15 years or something. Um, and just not even, like, people we work with, but there's a group, like, that core group of us that started that book club. We are all still friends and like we still talk about our books um I mean we don't talk all the time but it's just so nice that like this category of books um brought us all together and I love my little book friends like <laughs> and I'm just thankful for it I was really excited when I saw that you were going to talk about these because I think I've talked about this series at least oh. twice on literary libations <laughs> and I wanted to do it again and I was like no don't talk about mercy <laughs> But it's one of my favorite series too. And I, I have to say this, Jennifer, I don't know if you want to throw them back up there, but do not judge this series by the covers. Yes, please. <laughs> the covers look, I mean, pretty, pretty She's, intense, but they're not like that. The main character is a Volkswagen mechanic. She's actually very masculine, I guess you would kind of say. Um, and these character the, the covers make it look like some weird like harlequin-esque you know and that's totally not it mercy's an incredibly strong awesome female character and the rest of the characters are fantastic too and if you like fantasy so good so mm -hmm. so good yeah don't 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 judge don't yeah, judge no. by these because mm -mm. no. this is not mercy yeah <laughs> i mean so really it's you know same as always don't judge a book by its cover maybe we could um put some book covers on those jen and just start passing them <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so good though. And and I, I will say during pretty early in the pandemic, one of the people from um, the original group of book club, Evie Werner, um, or she's Evie Murphy now, I said her name wrong, um, brought me over a whole bunch of Mercy books. She said, hey, I'm cleaning off my bookshelves. I know you love these. Do you want them? Yes, I do. And she dropped them <laughs> off on my porch. We did a contact list, you know. 
So yeah, they're just books. I've even reread some. Of, like they're just so good. It's I reread good the entire book. series. Like when we shut down, I was like, yeah. I need home for books. I'm reading Mercy Town. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Plus, you know, awesome friends came from these books. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ashley. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to share my choices for books that I am thankful for. And I'm going to talk first about Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. And I read these books probably second, third grade, and I just love them. I've shared them with my son. I love reading them out loud. I've listened to the audiobooks with Tony as well. We've reread them. And I'm not sure exactly what the appeal is. Um, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle is appealing in and of herself because she lives in an upside down house and she smells like cookies and she used to be married to a pirate. But the amazing thing about Mrs. Piggle Wiggle is that if a child is struggling with something, usually something that's annoying their parents, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle always had the solution, always. So in this first book, there's one where the the Hubert, they always had lovely names, Hubert, Hubert Prentice won't pick up his toys. And, you know, the normal solution to that for me as a parent is to go into the child's room and go, we're going to get this cleaned up. You got to get this cleaned up. Let's get it cleaned up. We're going to get it cleaned up. And then you start cleaning it up and you throw things away and, you, you know, you sort through stuff and you make the kid do it. No, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle's solution was um, to have kids reach the consequences of their actions. And so Hubert, fine, don't pick up. Continue never picking up, Hubert. One day, Hubert can't get out of his bedroom. He has so much stuff crammed in there, he can't get out. He is stuck in there. Nobody can feed him. He can't go to the bathroom. Hubert's got a problem. The only way Hubert's getting out of that bedroom is guess what? He's got to clean up his stuff. He's got to put it where it belongs. He's got to get rid of it. it don't belong there. This fascinates me even as an adult. Like, oh, can I just let things reach their natural conclusion and my child will somehow magically figure out that you need to put things where they belong? I don't know. Probably not. I haven't let it go that far yet. Can I? And there's a lot of them. Pardon? I just want to jump in for a second. Yeah. Um, so my husband is very much like that. He doesn't pick his stuff up, right? And we've had this discussion. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to leave it. I'm just going to leave it. And he's like, you do not want to see how bad I will let it go. He would definitely be Hubert. Like, he, he <laughs> wouldn't be able to escape anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got that in my life, too. Bless their hearts. <laughs> so... But the other one, and they're all like that, particularly in their first book, she doesn't do magic in the first book. In the later books, there's like an element of magic. In the first book, it's all like, there's Patsy, Patsy Waters, who doesn't want to take a bath. Patsy doesn't care if she smells bad. Patsy doesn't really care what's going to happen. So what they end up doing to Patsy is they let her get dirty enough that there's a layer of dirt on her skin and then her parents go in and plant radish seeds and so Patsy starts growing radishes which is uncomfortable and not enjoyable but you always got a snack so ultimately finally Patsy decides to go and take a bath because she the natural consequences of the poor decisions that she's making and the same thing happens with um there's one, his name is Alan. They don't give a last name, just Alan. And he's a very slow eater. And mom's at her wit's end. Every meal takes forever. And so Mrs. Piggle Wiggle's solution is to give Alan continually a smaller and smaller and smaller set of dishes until finally, like, he's eating with, like, a toothpick. And, but he's only allowed to eat whatever's on the teeny tiny plate. So at least the meal isn't lasting forever. Well, clearly what's going to happen is poor Alan. I mean, don't actually do this in real life, people, because basically you're starving your kid. But poor Alan gets so weak and so tired that he just can't do anything. He can't go out and play with his friends anymore. He can't do the games that he enjoys. He can't go to school. 
And so finally he starts to eat. He starts to eat at proper speed because you need to be healthy and we need to get through meals and we want to go and do other stuff. So I don't know if as a child I just was like, I like seeing people get their comeuppances. You know, listen, you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. This is what's going to happen to you. I don't know if that's my sense of fair play, if I just like naughty children. I don't know, but I love Miss Piggle Wiggle. I love all the solutions that happen to these kids because they're always just if you keep doing this, this is what's going to happen. So Miss Piggle Wiggle. I, I do think that maybe Shel Silverstein was a Miss Piggle Wiggle fan. <laughs> Possibly because he does the same thing a lot. lot. Yeah, yeah. You he don't has pick up the garbage. Right, he has a poem in there about the dirtiest kid in the world, for instance. And so, you know, maybe he really liked Miss Piggle Wiggle. Miss Piggle Wiggle. Yeah, because I think Miss Piggle Wiggle, I'd have to go back and look, but I would say 50s 1947. And 60s. I, I did 47. just look it up. 1947 was yeah. the first Miss Piggle Wiggle. And since Shel Silverstein's Where the Sidewalk Ends is 1974, that would be the perfect age for him, right? See? So he, he was probably was a Miss Piggle Wiggle. Miss Piggle Wiggle fan. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Betty McDonald, for influencing all of us. And then my other one is also a writer from a generation ago. Um, it is The Winter People by Phyllis Whitney. And the reason I'm thankful for this is not this is a completely bonkers book, um, but it's one of the first books I got to read from the adult fiction section when I was in that 12 to 13 age range, because they didn't used to have a teen section or a young adult section. It was pretty much you're in the children's section and then there's adult fiction. And so I still remember going into the Flint Public Library and my mom telling me at some point, do you want to go look at the mysteries in the adult section? I don't know. And there's such a wide variety of books and choices that I was like, I don't even know where to start. And so my mom suggested Phyllis Whitney, Mary Higgins Clark and Agatha Christie, um, because most of those are what you would call fairly clean reads. There isn't going to be sex or language in them, you know, just people dying. <laughs> so but Phyllis Whitney was one of them. And I think I read every Phyllis Whitney book that was out there. And she is probably closest to being like a gothic, romantic, psychological thriller writer. And in Winter People, you have Dina who meets Glenn and they decide to get married really, really quickly. So quickly that Glenn doesn't tell her that he has a twin sister, nor that they're going to go and live at High Towers, the family estate in the Northeast where it's very, very cold and that Dina has never been. She's not met his family. She's not met the sister. She didn't even know he had a twin sister. Dina is maybe not the sharpest tool in the toolbox, possibly. Um, you read this now and I'm kind of like, oh, Dina. Dina, 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 you got to make better choices. <laughs> this, this is not, this is not, this is not good. But as a 12 year old, I was amazed at this book and it was super creepy. So she goes, lives at the family estate, meets the hitherto unknown sister whose name is Glynis. Is that not the best name? Glynis, Glenn and Glynis. That's awesome. And they meet, Glynis hates Dina. But, you know, can't just come out and go, hey, I hate you. I wish you weren't here. No, she's super passive aggressive and creepy about it. So weird things keep happening to Dina. Her husband gets there and Glenn starts doing this sculpture of her, but he's not going to let Dina see it. And that's real weird and spooky. Their parents are, are, well, the dad has passed away. The parents are real weird. It's all real controlling. And then it snows. And now she's stuck at High Tower with these weird, strange people that she's discovering she does not know. And things just go wild and crazy and completely off the rails. Um, so it's nutty. Um, and, and also, you know, I was reading the Goodreads reviews and somebody points out, you know, there's an amazing scene where they celebrate Christmas and Glenn tries on his Christmas gifts. What did Glenn get in 1969? A white silk turtleneck a leopard print jacket and a gold chain link medallion. Glenn is going to be looking good for Christmas. 
So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's to be appreciated that is definitely of its time. It's a bonkers novel, but what I'm thankful for is that I had parents that took me to the library that said, hey, read what you want to read. Here are some ideas to start with, but my parents never said, no, you can't read that author. You can't read that author. It was completely open to me. So I love that. And I'm pretty sure reading these gothic romances are probably still influencing my reading choices today because I still love psychological thrillers and now I love horror novels as well. I wasn't into that then. So I'm pretty sure that because of my mom introducing me to Phyllis Whitney, I now love the books that I love. So thanks mom, because my parents usually listen to this. So thanks mom and dad. So those are our books that we're thankful for. I hope that everybody um, thank you to those who um, participated today for taking the time out of your day to share the books you're thankful for. I hope that everybody listening has an amazing and happy Thanksgiving. And we will not be recording next week. We're taking a week off. But when we return, we will be talking about the books that we read again and again and again. So we'll be sharing those books. And when we share those, it's going to be pretty close to December. So we are in the holiday season, so it is here. So again, I hope you have fabulous weeks, have lovely Thanksgivings. Bye.